For AZPM, I'm Mark McLemore, and this is Arizona Spotlight. Coming up. Drag comes more naturally to me, perhaps, than Elvis does. I think it's because I have more access to swishing my hips than um, protruding the pelvis, as it were. Meet Kevin Cantor, the star of Arizona Theater Company's new comedy with music, The Legend of Georgia McBride. Go courtside with middle school students who are building skill and character, learning to play wheelchair basketball. A review of the documentary, Feelings Are Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner, and a conversation with filmmaker Jack Walsh. And hop into the pond with stories that soar for the beginning of a relationship that seems meant to be in Rainbow Frog. Those stories are next on Arizona Spotlight. The new Arizona Theatre Company production, The Legend of Georgia McBride, was almost a thing of the past. According to star Kevin Cantor, the play had what is known as a clopening. It debuted on March 13th of 2020, but then was shut down due to the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. But the creative team hoped and waited, and this Saturday evening, The Legend of Georgia McBride makes its return to the ATC stage. We'll hear much more next from Kevin Cantor in this interview with Leah Britton. Can you describe the legend of Georgia McBride in one sentence? One sentence with a lot of commas, yes. Uh, So the legend of Georgia McBride is about a straight, married Elvis impersonator who is fired from his job as an Elvis impersonator, replaced by a B-string drag queen act, and uh, so he starts doing drag to make ends meet. That's so fun. It is a joyous time. Fish out of water, or rather, out of water and into fishnet stockings. How has the process of you preparing for this role been? I am a sort of lifelong lover of drag, uh, so it's been really wonderful to step into the heels of Georgia McBride. As far as preparing is concerned, I shaved my legs this morning. Uh, But beyond that, um, what's really fun about this show is because it's a 90-minute play, you know, some drag performers will spend a full hour getting into makeup and costume. Here we have 90 seconds. Um, So it's sort of perfecting not only drag, but also the magic act of getting in and out of drag really quickly. So that's been a really fun facet to explore while rehearsing this production. You play a character, Casey, who then plays two more characters, Elvis and Georgia McBride. How do you balance keeping all of those different characters and personas kind of in line? It's really interesting to see the way in which something like an Elvis impersonation can evolve and adapt to lend itself to the art of drag. Uh, at the end of the day, it is, again, about forming persona. Um, I am also fired as Elvis relatively early on in the show. Uh, so we, we, only, we only get a taste of Elvis before really seeing uh, Georgia flourish. Um, but just like so much of Georgia comes from Casey, there are elements of his Elvisness that make its way into the Georgia persona, which is a fun little journey to track. Between your personas, which one comes as more of a challenge and which one's a little bit easier for you to slip into? (laughs) I would be lying uh, if I said I didn't feel more comfortable in Georgia's heels. You know, uh, drag comes more naturally to me, perhaps, than uh, Elvis does. I think it's because I have more access to swishing my hips than um, protruding the pelvis, (laughs) as it were. But it is really fun to be able to play both sides of the coin and realize that while Casey uh, and Georgia are different personas, they come from the same person um, and that Georgia couldn't exist without Casey uh, and really being able to find the beauty and joy in Georgia as it derives from the man that Casey is. You mentioned that you have a little bit more experience with drag. Has this role changed your perspective of drag at all? I was already a lover. I love it all the more. 
And now a true, newfound, and deep respect for drag performers. Uh, it is not easy. It is a dedicated art form. Um, I've been lucky enough in our cast to work with Corder Simmons, who plays Miss Tracy Mills, and Armand Fields, who plays uh, Rexy, who, in addition to their work as actors, are also professional drag queens in their own right. And their expertise that they've lent to this process has been invaluable. They really know what it takes to be a full-time drag performer, not just play one on stage. And what's been your favorite part about playing this role? Doing drag. I mean, it it, it really is that simple. It, it It is such a joyous and joyful art form. I've learned things about myself through the process um, that have been really rewarding and illuminating. It's just a gift to be able to feel beautiful and have fun doing it um everyone should try drag everyone should try drag i am a fierce proponent of that so kevin this show's run in tucson comes at a time where drag as an art form has been targeted by lawmakers across the country why do you feel like it's important to have stories that center this kind of experience yeah as a preface i'll say plainly Drag is not a crime. Drag is not dangerous. Drag is for everyone. And I think that this show encapsulates that idea and and puts it on display that there is room for all of us in drag and for all of us to be benefactors of the joy that drag inspires. And this story is an exhibition of that. Also, one of the grand ironies of this sort of baseless assertion that drag is somehow inappropriate for young people is that in many ways drag is about returning to a childlike sense of play about allowing ourselves access to the joy and beauty and celebration in ourselves and in the world that we had access to before the world told us what we could and could not be I mean, drag is so many things, but that is certainly one of them. The Legend of Georgia McBride, I think, is for everyone, for the whole family. I mean, there's a few curse words in there. Maybe it's a PG-13 rating, but, like, bring the whole family. Let us all be enriched by what drag can offer us. What do you hope audiences take away from the show? If you are a lover of theater, you're going to be a lover of drag. And I hope that when folks come and see this show, they're inspired to go out and support their local drag scenes. There are so many drag artists working here in Tucson, in Arizona, all across the country that need our support right now, that need voices and presences in their venues uh, and supporting what I consider to be and I don't speak hyperbolically here, a life-saving art form. You know, I am a queer artist who is here today because of my queerness and in part because of queer entertainers and artists like drag performers. Um, So go out there and support your local queens. Leah Britton interviewed Kevin Cantor, who's starring in Arizona Theatre Company's production of The Legend of Georgia McBride. It's at the Temple of Music and Art from June 3rd to June 24th before heading to Phoenix to start a run on June 29th. Next, Paula Rodriguez takes us to Gridley Middle School in Tucson, where they're collaborating with a group called Southern Arizona Adaptive Sports to change our understanding of ability in athletics. This first-of-its-kind program will help equip local schools to include adaptive sports in their physical education plans. In this case, the sport is wheelchair basketball. Among the voices you'll hear is Gridley PE teacher and city council member Paul Cunningham. Coach Beard is ready for our jump ball. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen in attendance, are you ready? Let's get ready to rumble. Today was the final day of our uh, inclusion recreation program where able-bodied kids were exposed to wheelchair basketball. They got to play wheelchair basketball with uh, wheelchair athletes 
over the course of the week. They got to gain some perspective. They got to learn some life lessons. They were challenged with some tough questions like, hey, it's great that you played wheelchair basketball, but what if you couldn't get out of the chair? And for a middle schooler, that's a really introspective question. And I think it gives them a great impact and perspective on, on their growth. Teachers know that look. That look that a kid gets when they're really thinking about something and you've actually challenged their mind and got them to really acquire knowledge. And that's, when you see that look 50 times in one hour, that's the best feeling you can get in a teacher. And that's what we got this week. We got a lot of that. As a teacher, I couldn't even be prouder of our kids because in a lot of ways, this brought out the best in our students. And that's why I really enjoyed teaching this unit. Well, I think when you teach PE, it's not like when we were kids, hey, climb a rope and get an A. Uh, PE has changed. We want to get kids moving. We want to get them fitness minded, but we also want them to be good people. There's a big citizenship and teamwork piece to physical education. And I think this, the learning objectives outlined in this lesson plan meet all those challenges. So my name is Mia Hansen and I'm the executive director and one of the founders of Southern Arizona Adaptive Sports. We're also known as SAS. Today is the launch of a special new program where we are bringing adaptive sports and inclusive recreation into schools. Sports are for everybody, and wheelchair basketball, for example, or seated volleyball is just another sport, just another piece of equipment that you can use to play and to have fun. We will, we will rock you. You know, activity and, and physical fitness is so important for all kids, but especially kids with physical disabilities. Some studies are showing that as many as 50 to 60 percent of kids with physical disabilities are just opting out of PE in school because they, the teachers aren't able to accommodate them or they don't have the equipment. This new program is going to bring equipment. We're going to bring these wheelchairs to any school that wants them. We're going to teach the teachers how to teach the curriculum and then we're going to let them go have fun. This young man who's about to fist bump me here, Esteban, how old are you, Esteban? I'm nine and I'm turning ten in le less than one month. Hey, Esteban, what was it like for you today to be here showing off your wheelchair skills to all these kids? Honestly, I feel happy because uh, some of them don't even know what it feels like. Right, and you do, right? Yeah. You were kind of able to school them up a little bit? Yeah. And you were sort of a superstar today? Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. And you got a very special gift. What did you get today? What are you sitting in? I'm sitting in a special gift from the Hartford people. The Hartford people, and they gave you a new sports wheelchair. Not a minute left. Part of the problem here is that there's a lot of barriers for kids like Estevan to get this kind of equipment. It's expensive. This chair he's sitting in is four to $5,000. So we were able to get this support from the Hartford, from Move United, which is our umbrella organization that we belong to, and, you know, someone like Estevan is now a superstar in front of thousands of kids, right? So this is really helping someone like Estevan to be more confident, to have that ability like all kids want, to just be a part of something, a part of something big and exciting. And I think that, to me, is what, for p kids with disabilities who unfortunately often are bullied or have stigma about their disability, they're in here just participating and actually excelling. One of our kids just shot a three-pointer and drained it. Step side, LeBron James. <laughs> Good stuff. 13, 12, 11. Dead ball, dead ball. 11 seconds, 11 seconds. I think all the kids who, who are out there who are going to have a chance to experience this are really going to get firsthand, you know, what the importance and the impact is of all inclusivity. All right, everybody's in. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you sound like, what clothes you're wearing, if you have a different body part missing or you're disabled, it doesn't matter. You're all important and everyone deserves a chance to play and to excel. All right, Gridley, how about a round of applause for the Junior Wildcats and our husband and That feature by Paolo Rodriguez is part of AZPM's new podcast, More Than a Game. You can find the episodes at azpm.org.
non-conventional choreographer and filmmaker Yvonne Rayner blazed a unique trail as an artistic visionary, and her story is explored in a new documentary called Feelings Are Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner. It's airing on PBS 6 Plus on Saturday, June 9th. Next, you'll hear film essayist Chris DeShiel offer his reaction, followed by an interview with Feelings Are Facts filmmaker Jack Walsh. Chris DeShiel is an outside contributor to this show, and his opinions do not represent AZPM. Yvonne Rayner, dancer, choreographer, and filmmaker, is one of those figures whose importance is far greater than their lack of fame would make you think. I had seen one of her films, and I was intrigued by its austere, experimental methods, but I didn't grasp her wider significance. That is, until I watched a documentary directed by Jack Walsh called Feelings Are Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner. This is one of those rare biographical films that conveys an artist's vision in a clear, understandable way, as well as presenting her life story. Walsh's structure in his film reflects an intuitive, non-linear approach reminiscent of Rayner's own work. First, we were made familiar with the questions and challenges that Rayner posed to herself, which resulted in new approaches to the dance. She discovered that she was primarily interested in the movements of the human body itself, rather than the expression of dramas, stories, or abstract ideas. Over time, she found herself focusing on what she calls pedestrian movement, the ordinary, repetitive physical actions of the body in everyday life. In this, she was pushing away the innovations in modern dance of the early 20th century by choreographers such as Martha Graham, with whom she trained. For a while, she studied with Merce Cunningham and John Cage, whose works relied on chance rather than conscious design. In 1962, she helped found the Judson Dance Theater in New York, where she and other choreographers could develop their avant-garde dance pieces. After the film has familiarized us with this artistic upheaval, Walsh steps back to relate some of Rayner's life story, her childhood in the San Francisco area from one of the few Jewish families in the neighborhood, her mother so neurotic that she gave Yvonne and her older brother up to a foster family because she couldn't handle trying to take care of them. Throughout the film, we weave back and forth in time with Rayner's vital artistic concerns set against the details of her biography. Watching feelings or facts is like getting to know a friend in her many aspects, not in a progressive linear fashion, but by establishing an intimacy that encompasses past and present. Excerpts from interviews with friends and critical observers provide good insights, but best of all are the interviews with Yvonne Rayner herself. In her 70s and 80s at the time of filming, brilliant, articulate, yet down to earth. When I hear avant-garde, I think of someone who stubbornly conquers all resistance, but Rayner is not about ego, only about the work. At one point, she says she's never wanted to be famous, and that having just a little group of about 100 people as her audience is enough to sustain her. From the mid-1960s through the 70s, Rayner made films with a similar approach that she had brought to choreography a radical disregard for the conventions of story or drama, a concern with the human as such, and often focusing on the contrast between the female body and the way it is viewed by men, an idea characteristic of feminist thought. The film provides us with generous excerpts from her movies and many dance performances, so that by the end of the movie we can be confident of having experienced the art of Yvonne Rayner to a depth that allows greater understanding. The film establishes for a wider audience the pivotal importance of an artist now getting the recognition she deserves. Feelings or Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner, has its television premiere June 9th on PBS. For Arizona Spotlight, I'm Chris DeShiel. And now I'm joined by documentarian Jack Walsh, who talks about making Feelings Are Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner. Actually, I started out as an experimental filmmaker, so I, I kind of got into documentary in a very roundabout way. I ended up in a public television station in San Francisco. So then, after working on a number of independent documentaries as a producer, I thought, well, I'm, I'm ready to do my own. And I came upon this subject with Yvonne because I had known her in New York. She was the bo- uh, on the board of directors of a nonprofit I ran called The Collective for Living Cinema. And she had wrote this memoir, and I read, I read it in the memoirs, Feelings or Facts. And I was completely taken with it. And after 
a number of back and forth emails about doing a film. She finally relented and allowed us to make the film about her. The title, Feelings or Facts, The Life of Yvonne Rayner, is such a strong title. Feelings or Facts, I think I've waited my whole life to hear somebody tell me that that's true. But explain in context how that title came about. Well, it's, it, as I said, lifted directly from the memoir. And for her, it's what a therapist told her in uh, probably in her 30s. And the reality is it's really feelings or facts. You have to really trust your feelings, that there's a lot of information that's being told to you very intuitively that oftentimes our logical mind suppresses or we talk ourselves to death and convince ourselves that our logical mind is the real versus really trusting your gut, I think is what it means. And I think that the film demonstrates it many, many times in her life when that's exactly what she did. If you imagine Yvonne as a person who is guided by a compass, what, what, what constitutes that compass? That's a great question. And I think that the North Star, you know, I think that if anything, from my knowledge of Yvonne, both as a subject and also as a friend, I think that she's, throughout her life, has been very ambitious. She's followed those ambitions. And I also think that she's also been very uh, morally upright, upholding, I guess I should say, in that she came out of a family that has certain political consciousness in the uh, 30s and 40s. And she remained true to those social justice values through her entire life. And into the last piece of hers I just saw in New York in October was very much about uh, white supremacy and really trying to address the argument not about Black Lives Matters, but what is white supremacy all about? And that's what the piece was really addressing. And, and her role in, as a white person in white supremacy. So I think that she's had a career of always wanting to do self-evaluation, not just of herself, but in terms of the social world that she lives in. And I think that her films definitely uh, show that and demonstrate that powerfully. There's a fascinating word that Yvonne uses to describe herself, recalcitrant and undancer-like, she even says. How do those factors play into her career as a dancer, performer, choreographer? It's important for people to understand that she never took a dance class until she was 25. So most young women start dance classes when they're three and four. And oftentimes for her generation, it was like they were headed towards ballet. That's the goal. Right. And I remember in interviewing her, we don't have it in the... Uh, in the film, but uh, she was studying with Martha Graham, and Martha Graham was chiding her for not having adequate enough turnout. And she said, well, you're never going to have turnout until you become a woman, which for Martha Graham meant having a baby. And so I think that she, she was in a world where she was studying initially in a very traditional ways, even though like it was with Graham, but so Graham had a very strict uh, language that she was teaching. So I think that she realized that she had to take what assets she had because they weren't going to fit into like the, the standard beautiful body model and just forge her own way. So I think that early on, just understanding that I'm not going to fit into this world, but that shouldn't stop me. And I think that comes back to where she's, you know, ambition really comes in because she was going to be unstoppable, which she was. I am not a dancer. I don't feel comfortable in that world. But seeing Yvonne and seeing some of the dances she has created, I felt inspired. I felt enabled. It wasn't just Yvonne, though. It was that whole group of choreographers at Judson Dance Theater who really were eschewing all of this rigidity. And, I mean, they were all known for introducing pedestrian movement, you know, running, walking, just sitting and eating a sandwich as part of performance. And many of them, Yvonne included, would use non-professional performers in those early works. Oddly, they all kind of later in life, now that they're in their 70s and 80s, are all working with these highly trained dancers. Uh, and that's kind of a whole new, I think, epiphany. That was documentary filmmaker Jack Walsh. Feelings are facts. The Life of Yvonne Rayner can be seen on June 9th at 8 p.m. on PBS 6 Plus. There's a link to the schedule on the Spotlight page at azpm.org.
The Tucson nonprofit Literacy Connects sponsors a group of performers and musicians called Stories That Soar. They help young writers realize the power and potential of bringing their stories to life. And we're presenting these stories on the first Thursday of every month here on Spotlight. This feel-good tale of acceptance and connection was written by Kimberly, a fifth-grade student at Robeson Magnet School. It's called Rainbow Frog. One day, there was a rainbow frog named Elijah. Elijah hung out with girl frogs and rarely hung out with boy frogs. But one day, Elijah saw a nice-looking boy frog. He wanted to be his friend. But there was one problem. The boy frog was crowded by other frogs. That made Elijah a little upset. But... Someone tapped on Elijah's back. He looked back and saw the nice-looking boy frog. Elijah stuttered his name, which made the frog laugh, which made Elijah smile. And they became friends. And years later, they started dating. The end. That was Rainbow Frog, written by Kimberly, a fifth grader at Robeson Magnet School. Go Roadrunners! It was produced by the Stories That Soar creative team at Literacy Connects. Thank you for listening to Arizona Spotlight. This show is a production of AZPM. The music is by Calexico. The production engineer is Jim Blackwood. The assistant producer is Leah Britton. I'm producer and host Mark McLemore. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.